right, go ahead. Jennifer. All right, hello everyone. Um, welcome to another session of the Portland State University Friday Transportation Seminar. I'm Dr. Jenny Liu, one of the hosts in the School of Urban Studies and Planning. And today we're very fortunate to welcome Sarah Goforth from the Portland Bureau of Transportation. She is an expert in transportation demand management and um, also, uh, she got her master's from the Portland State University, so she's here today to talk about the transportation wallet, and I'm going to pass the floor over to her. Thank you. Um, where, uh, this is my hometown, where I have grown up, and I'm going to talk to you today about the transportation wallet, uh, or in other words, I've seen parking can create new mobility options. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to Thanks to uh, the people who really make the transportation wallet possible. Um, this wouldn't be possible without Chris Arms, who works for the Portland Bureau of Transportation in our parking operations group. Um, she is basically the reason why we have a wallet program. And then to three particular people who make the wallet um, implementation possible, Joey Posada from Portland Bureau of Transportation, who is here in the front row, works very closely with me, and then Danielle Booth from Bike Town and Natasha Kelly from Portland Streetcar. Um, and then, of course, uh, we are able to do these cool parking uh, management um, plans because we have some stakeholder advisory committees, uh, the Northwest Parking Stakeholder Advisory Committee, and then the Central East Side Industrial Council. So just wanted to give a little shout out to those people um, and those agencies. So what is the transportation wallet? Well, it is a package of three passes put together into one consumer product. So for those of you who are watching remotely, um, TriMet is our local transit um, provider and they provide uh, bus and light rail service. Uh, Portland Streetcar, kind of self-evident, it's our streetcar here. And then Bike Town is our bike share system. And so what we've done with the transportation wallet is we have combined $100 for use on TriMet, an annual streetcar pass, and an annual Bike Town membership into one product that we call the transportation wallet. So how it works is um, we've, uh, we have two parking districts that are eligible to receive the transportation wallet. So this is a, a map of the city of Portland boundary. And we have two rivers that run through Portland. So in the north, uh, that's the Columbia River. And for those of you watching from out of state, um, north of the Columbia River is Washington State. And so then uh, through the heart of Portland, uh, through downtown actually, is the Willamette River. And on either side of the Willamette River are two parking districts. So we have the Northwest Portland Parking District in orange and the Central East Side Industrial Parking District in blue. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each parking district because they're kind of unique. Um, so the Northwest Portland Parking District is a densely populated neighborhood that has um, good transit connectivity. It's really walkable and it also has our highest bike town station density in all of the service area of um, bike town. So it's really good connected. Um, it's also um, uh, a mix of a lot of historic single family homes and now new multifamily buildings. And it is also still developing. So a lot of new people um, have been moving to the district, but also a lot of new commuters are coming to the district for employment. Um, as I mentioned next, it's a mix of residents and commuters. And then from a parking district standpoint policy, um, because this is now one of our managed parking districts, um, the stakeholder advisory committee um, had voted to include a $105 surcharge to the base cost of being able to park your car uh, long-term on the street. So it costs you 52 cents a day to park your car uh, on the street. And uh, I do have a little caveat there that we waive this um, extra surcharge for people living on low income. So it costs 75 bucks as the base cost, $105 surcharge. So by comparison, we have the Central East Side Industrial Parking District. So it's on the other side of the Lamette River. Between the two parking districts is our Central Business District. Um, this is really um, a district that is, um, uh, has a high concentration of commuters. So while there are multifamily uh, buildings here, they're actually restricted from purchasing parking permits based off of what our parking operations um, staff policies are. So this is really just um, a lot of people are coming here for their work. Um, again, like Northwest Portland, a lot of multifamily buildings. Uh, it's also still developing, a lot of, a lot of new uh, development there for people who are from here and know that. Also walkable, good transit connectivity. And because of our parking permit surcharges, um, the entire district here uh, was a 
was a bike town uh, parking area um, early on. So anybody who had an annual membership could park at any of our parking, uh, excuse me, bike racks here in the district. And then unlike Northwest Portland, whose um, base cost is $105, the the Central East Side uh, Parking District added um, a $225 surcharge to the base cost of parking permits. So it is still only 82 cents a day to park your car. Um, how the wallet works is you either live or work in these parking districts and um, anybody can purchase the transportation wallet for 85% off the retail cost. And the other way that you can obtain a transportation wallet is you can get it for free, which is pretty awesome. So you can trade in your on-street parking permit and get one of these wallets for free. So that's kind of the basics of how it works. All right, let's talk for a second about the origin of Portland's parking permit surcharge programs. And before you think, I'm just gonna gloss you all over with a bunch of, bunch of boring parking policy, I'm actually just gonna give it to you in a nutshell. <laughs> so um, the, uh, the parking permit surcharge programs, as we know it today, um, they took many, many years to develop uh, with lots of uh, meetings almost a decade ago. And it wasn't easy to get where we are today with our transportation wallet program, not even here in Portland, where you think, oh yeah, everybody wants to ride their bike and ride transit. Um, City Council approved the parking management plans back in 2012 and 2013, and uh, some stakeholder committees were formed. So each district has their own committees that um, is a mix of businesses, uh, representatives, residents, and of course our PWOT city staff that make decisions on about how the districts are functioned wasn't until 2015-2016 um, that those permit surcharges were adopted. And also it's um, important to mention that while we're here in Portland um, and we have two parking districts, each parking district is totally unique and they have totally different rules. So no two, no two are alike. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how uh, if you combine parking management with TDM strategies, you're like, what the heck's TDM? Glad you asked. <laughs> so TDM, I'm gonna give you a little primer here. So TDM in the transportation world stands for Transportation Demand Management. And basically what it is, is it's a tool to manage demand and improve efficiency on our transportation system. So if you look on the right-hand slide, a side of the slide, I have three city blocks and it shows how many people can be moved on the streets uh, depending on what mode they use. So the top one is the least efficient form of uh, moving people. So if 28 people each drove their own car, which is pretty typical, um, they would take up a city block uh, with three, three streets in it. You got that same city block, what if everybody got onto transit? So obviously you're not gonna put buses um, neck to neck, but you know if you put five buses on that same city block, you're now suddenly moving 225 people. And the bottom one, it's not really feasible to have a thousand people walking on the street, but really what this is showing is if you, if you switch up driving alone in your own private vehicle and you incorporate different modes, you're gonna more um, in, uh, improve efficiency on how people get around. So really what transportation demand management does is it encourages people to walk, bike, take transit. We have e-scooters here now in Portland, um, carpool, you know, team up with one another. It also says, you know, what if you, what if you took one day a week and you worked from home? So all of this is to discourage that, that um, scenario at the top where you have the least efficient form of moving people um, and, and have you split it up into different modes. So that's transportation demand management in a nutshell. What about parking management? So there's three kind of main goals um, of good parking management strategies. And so the first one is you really just wanna better manage the existing on-street parking system. You wanna decrease traffic congestion so you have fewer people needing those same parking spots. And then you also just really wanna make it easier for people to find parking who really do need that parking, whether they're visitors, customers, employees. Um, so how do you do this? So there's three, three main strategies. The first one is you eliminate free parking. And I can't stress this one enough. Um, if you have free parking, basically you just have private vehicle storage and there's no turnover. And so you never can access where you need to go. Um, you have a lot more people um, circling around for parking that doesn't exist. So if you price parking, you are um, increasing the amount of supply available to people at any given time. Another strategy, which is what we do here in Portland, is we are decreasing the number of issued parking permits. You have fewer people needing to find parking for a limited amount of space on our roadways. And then also expanding um, where you have to pay to park, whether that's by permit or by meter. So we did that in both of the parking districts I showed you before. So what happens when you take parking management and you team it up with transportation demand management. 
imagine this like beautiful relationship right here. Well, what, what happens is you got rid of your free parking and now all of a sudden you have dedicated funding for TDM strategies. So what kind of strategies? Well, what we're doing here in Portland is we are able to discount our transit and bike share passes through our transportation wallet program. Um, we're able to take some of that money and do low cost uh, transit, bike and ped infrastructure improvements. So think like enhanced crossings, um, stuff of that nature. And then we also need to like tell people about what we're doing and how they can access these uh, great benefits. So, you know, running marketing and encouragement campaigns. And so how do you take people who are used to driving for the majority of their trips and kind of change their perception about maybe I can switch one or two trips a week. Maybe I could, you know, ride the bus. Maybe I could walk. So really, how do you go from testing the TDM water <laughs> to really drinking from the source? Like, how do you do that? Well, um, I ran a, um, I did a, I did a pilot back in 2017 where I used some behavioral science techniques to, to see if I could get people who normally drive all the time to try out transit. And so for those of you unfamiliar with behavioral science, it's basically, um, it's just like a, it's a methodology to shed light on like, why do people do things, whether that's consciously or unconsciously. Um, it's sort of like a marketing strategy that resonates with people at their core. Um, one of the techniques is to make your messaging easy, you make it attractive, you make it social, and you make it timely. And so in these examples that I'm showing here, um, I had sort of three strategies that I was using. So on the right hand side, I made opting into my offer of yes, I want two free tickets on Portland Streetcar, and yes, I want two free you know, a free day pass in Bike Town. I made it easy. So those are actually uh, clickable images that I put into my my email um, that I sent out. And so for people to opt in, all I had to do was like click that image. Boom! I made it super easy. Um, the other strategy I mentioned is making it attractive. So I'm sort of resonating with people of like get to work this week without the pain of parking. They're like, oh yeah, it does kind of suck to have to find parking. Choose a week on transit. Here you go. I'm just going to give it to you. Um, and then I also made this timely. I set a time frame. I was like in the next week or to the first 200 people. So these were the marketing strategies I used. And so how did I actually do it? I conducted a randomized control trial. And so I had the contact information of 2,000 residents and 2,000 employees in both of my parking districts. And I had their contact info because they uh, renewed parking permits. So these are people who drive. And I randomly assigned them to one of two groups. And so they could receive either a day pass on their choice of transit and then a week pass. So two different email solicitations or the inverse opposite. I was offering a big offer up front, a week pass and then a day pass. So what do you think they did? Um, I want to mention first and foremost that I had over a 40% um, email open rate. So it's kind of a test to that idea that make your marketing attractive. So these are people who primarily drive and I got 40% people to open my email. If any of you do marketing, kind of the industry standard of success is around 25%. So I was pretty happy with that. Um, I had about 600 people want a day pass on either TriMet, Streetcar or Bike Town. And recall that these are the three offers that we have now in the transportation wallet. So what about the week pass people? Whoa, <laughs> I had a lot more people opt in. Um, I had 35% of those 4,000 people opt in and want, want these uh, transportation packages. And while we didn't fulfill all of them, I only had a budget for like f fulfillment about 200. Um, what this was showing me is that a whole bunch of people who drive, they actually wanted to try transit and wanted to try bike town. So this was a good indicator that, you know, people are interested in things uh, and maybe if you offer them at discounted or in this case, you offer them for free. So after this, I offered through help with my colleagues, we said, you know what, why don't we try to get new riders to um, Bike Town in the Northwest Parking District? Again, remember it has the highest station density of all the Bike Town uh, stations in the Bike Town service area. And so again, another example of an attractive marketing ploy, who doesn't love um, fuzzy animals in Bike Town baskets? I thought they're adorable. That's actually from animals from, from Instagram. Um, so Ride Bike Town all summer, it was actually three months for 10 bucks, and we got 352 people to sign up as annual members, which is pretty cool. Fast forward another month, and we decided, you know what? What if during the month of August, which is the month when people renew their on-street parking permit in the Northwest Parking District, what if we said, you know what, you can trade in your, your parking permit and in exchange we'll give you a year on Bike Town and we'll give you a $100 TriMet Hop card. For those of you watching remotely, Hop is now our new digital payment fare on TriMet. 
And so we um, we sort of were calling this the pre-wallet. There was actually, we didn't even call it the transportation wallet at the time, but for sakes and purposes here today, that's what I'm calling it. Um, despite our latent advertising, we got 126 people to say, you know what, I don't need my parking permit. So that was pretty cool. We traded, we had them trade in for, for these uh, options. Fast forward the next month, boom, transportation wallet 1.0 launches. And so here we were able to um, add another offer to what we were offering in the parking permit opt-outs. So uh, we were offering $50 uh, on TriMet, an annual streetcar pass, and then an annual bike town membership. Also really bad graphic design. I made this and I think it's really hideous. I'm not a graphic designer. So fast forward now to the beginning of 2018, we got a graphic designer. So uh, this is the transportation wallet that we've had uh, for the past year and we offered in both of our parking districts and the difference between what we were offering at the end of 2017 is we were able to already increase the TriMet value from 50 to 100 bucks. And then in that amount of time, Portland Streetcar wasn't yet on the digital um, hop card. So we, um, uh, we were able to add that, that streetcar pass to the same hop card. So now we have a consumer product that entails 100 bucks on TriMet, annual streetcar pass, and then the standalone Bike Town membership. Um, so this is this is the product that we have right now. So how do we get people to buy it or opt out for it? Because really the wallet can't promote itself. Um, so I wanted to mention all the different ways that we have been getting the word out about the transportation wallet um, because we're talking about these two massive parking districts and different user types. You got commuters, you got residents, people of all ages. So there's not one size fits all uh, with how you market. So I just um, wanted to list out all the different ways we did it, especially to um, meeting with people on site, um, having events, handing out flyers, um, everything from print ad, digital ad, emails, um, and then a lot of personalized touches. There's a lot of um, touch points that we do with this. And for every person that we sort of impact, it's like they're, they're more likely to tell other people about it. So I just want to emphasize again, the transportation wallet is made possible by eliminating free parking. That is the reason why we have this program. And then in addition to it, it's about adding that surcharge to parking permits. All right, so let's meet the transportation wallet holders. Who are these people? Um, right now we have about 1900 transportation wallets in circulation. And of that, 40% um, of people have purchased them, but 60% of people have opted out of their on-street parking permit. So they traded it in to get one of these wallets for free. Um, so let's take a look first at the people who purchase it. So 760 people have purchased transportation wallets. And again, it's those three passes that are included. It's $99 uh, for them, but it's $684 in value. So this is subsidized um, at 85% off the retail cost of these passes. And people see a lot of utility in it. <clears throat> um, I asked people in a survey conducted earlier this fall, why did you buy the wallet? No, no big surprise. The biggest reason is because it's a good deal. I mean, 99 bucks, you're already getting that hundred dollars back in the TriMet value. Um, other people, you know, they want to take transit more, they want to bike and walk more. Um, but then the other two are really indicative of what we're seeing in these parking districts. There's a lot more people who are trying to access the same parking spaces. So they kind of just don't want to deal with driving every day. And they think it's kind of hard to find on street parking. So we also ask them, which statement is most true for you? Um, whether you would recommend the transportation wallet to family and friends, granted they have to be eligible, not everybody's eligible for this, um, if they would purchase it again or both of the above. And so this is captures 94% of uh, people um, are really pleased with the product. So we have a really high satisfaction rate um, by the people who are buying the wallet. Um, what about people who don't have a wallet? So a um, lot more respondents here um, for this question. Same transportation survey that we conducted earlier this year. So 482 people said, um, are you considering uh, getting a wallet in the future? 12% said yes. So that's that's indicative that, you know, there's interest. 44% um, said no, totally fine. But the other 44%, they were unsure. And so what this is sort of showing us is that there's interest out there um, for people to consider, like, yeah, maybe this is a good option for me to add to my toolkit. Some days I'll drive, some days I'll take China, maybe I'll ride bike town in between. Um, I think it's a pretty cool um, uh, piece of feedback that we got from the survey. Okay, the other user group that we have are people who have their own residential parking permit. And so these are people who live 
uh, in uh, Northwest Portland primarily. Remember when I was describing the two parking districts, Northwest Portland had residents. Um, the, the, you can trade out your on-street parking permit for a transportation wallet for free. And so we had 100 people in the Northwest Parking District this year trade out their parking permit. Um, while there are people who reside in the east, uh, the Central Eastside Parking District, they are exempt if they are in those new buildings. So for this um, data point, it's really just looking at Northwest. So 100 people opted out this year and we asked them, why did you trade it? Top three reasons. Um, some people are getting rid of their car. And I don't think this is necessarily like one car. This might be if they have one or more cars. Um, they also think permits are expensive. Um, they think it's hard to find on-street parking. And then we're seeing the same thing. It's a good deal to save money. Um, this is also really interesting. They have a parking spot. So we're encouraging people to, to use what's right in front of them, whether that's their garage or their driveway, um, so that there's more parking available for people who don't have access to a parking spot. And then some people, um, for whatever reason, are uh, unable to drive anymore, and so they just don't need their car, and so they're getting a transportation wallet in exchange for the permit that is no longer necessary for them. All right, the last group of transportation wallet holders are our employer parking permit opt-outs. And so the way that we do this here in Portland is uh, if you're an employee in the parking districts, you can't just say, hey, I need a parking permit. It goes through your employer and your employer fills out paperwork based off of how many employees you have at your business. So it's not a one-to-one. -one. We're already limiting the number of parking permits issued um, based on a calculation. And I mentioned that uh, because in one of my slides I said, how are we decreasing the amount of parking permits issued? This is one of the ways in our employer program um, in one of the districts, we only offer it at 80% of your full-time employees. So if you have a company of 10 people who work full-time, only eight people are eligible for a permit. So already we're cutting it down by two. Um, so we said, hey, why don't you consider getting a transportation wallet for uh, uh, for free for your employees if you don't actually need those parking permits. And I think this is huge. We had 221 businesses in both of our parking districts opt out of 1,135 on-street permits in both districts this year, which is pretty huge considering we didn't have this a year ago. And so district by district, uh, in Northwest Portland, we had a 7% reduction in the number of permits issued by 65 businesses. And then we had a lot more in the Central East Side. Granted, there's a lot more employers over there. We had 11% reduction by 154 businesses. So it's pretty huge. Um, I also want to make note too that of those businesses who opted out in the Northwest, 48% of those businesses traded in 50% or more of their eligible permits. Some traded in all their permits, granted it might have only been one or two. Um, but I think that's really telling that not only are we getting people to opt out of their permits for their employers, uh, excuse me, their employees, but they're opting out of a large percentage and then a little bit higher numbers in Central East Side, 52% of those 165 businesses opt out of half or all of their eligible permits. And then we do have a restriction um, on how many transportation wallets they can get for free out of um, trying to make sure that we're not just blowing our budget. So we capped it at 20 and we had three businesses in Northwest and seven businesses in Central East Side get the maximum allotment of 20. Steve, you have a question. Yeah, how do you decide, begin with how many permits are available to local businesses and are available in there's not, there's, so, so Steve was asking, how do we decide how many permits are available to um, businesses? And so there's not a hard cap. It's actually a percentage of total of full-time employees. And so for the whole district, I mean, is there a cap? Yeah, and so Steve was asking if there's a cap on the whole district. There is not. Uh, there's just there's calculations based off of if you're an employer or in the case of um, Northwest Portland, there's a limit to the number of permits issued by building depending on the year of occupancy. So it's a little wonky there, but there's not a hard cap um, on the number of issued permits. So um, we can wait. At the, it's only because you're not mic'd and I have to repeat your, your question, but we'll follow up in a second, okay? Anyway, we've reduced parking permits in uh, the parking districts uh, just this year. And I think um, a big reason is because we are pricing our permits in a way that is reducing demand. So I made this chart uh, to show the price increase over the last three years of parking permits in the Central East Side uh, parking district. And so in 2016, we didn't have a transportation wallet. Um, parking permits were $140 
and so indicated by the red line and the black line uh, shows that you know there's there's almost 9,000 parking permits uh, out there in circulation. 2017, the price went up again to $210. We still didn't have a transportation wallet, but you're seeing that there's a there's a decrease because a lot of employers are like, ah, I don't know if I want to pay that money. Um, but then 2018, boom, we got the inverse opposite happening. So we see a sharp decline in the number of permits issued as the parking permit uh, price went up to $300. And I will say, however, we're not done issuing permits for the 2018 permit year. So it will increase from about 4,600, like you see on the chart, um, but it's not gonna cross back in the way it was two years ago. So really parking, if you price parking in an appropriate way, it's really gonna reduce demand and it's gonna help with um, having more supply available for people who, who do need it. So we asked people, why did your employer give you a transportation wallet? This is a really small um, response. Uh, um, pool it's only 53 respondents um, but I do think it's indicative of the story of like why are people doing this and the top three reasons you know it's really hard to find on-street parking kind of don't want to deal with it um, we're also getting a lot of businesses that recognize the value in switching up drive alone trips so they encourage less driving which is fantastic um, permits are obviously um, a little bit more expensive than they were a couple of years prior and so the business maybe doesn't want to absorb that cost um, but then there's other people who, you know, they're already biking, walking, taking transit. They don't commute with a car, but they're still eligible for a permit. They're like, heck yeah, I'll ride TriMet and streetcar and bike town for free. Um, and then I also want to point out that for people who get parking permits uh, from their employer, it's not their personal permit. It's not attached to a license plate. And so if you only drive two days a week, somebody else can take that permit for the other three days. So you don't need a car every day. And I think this shows up in the answers here. Um, people are encouraged to share their permits um, so that there's not everybody driving for every trip to their, to their place of employment. So what does 1,135 uh, parking permit opt-outs look like? So I illustrated that it is the equivalent of 32 blocks or 126 street segments of available parking. But let's not forget that it's not like you get a parking permit and you instantly get um, your own parking space. That's not how parking works. However, if each of those 1,135 people drove alone, which is a pretty common scenario, think about how, how they would be taking up the roadways. So we're decreasing congestion by having people trade out their parking permits. But we're also making a lot more parking available for people who do have to park and access the district. We ask people, where do you park? So this is a nice uh, big survey response number. We had 675 people who do not have a transportation wallet um, answer where they typically park in the two parking districts. So over half park on the street with their permit, that's kind of expected. Um, 12 and 6% uh, park off street. Uh, more of those are parking uh, for free. So again, that's like the driveway garage scenario. And then about 6% are paying to park in an off street lot. Um, and then we have about 15% of the people who took this survey who just don't drive or park to begin with. Um, so that's, that's to be expected. Not everybody's gonna be driving in these districts. What about people who have a transportation wallet? A lot fewer people who need uh, a parking permit. So 29% uh, park uh, on street with a permit, you know, down from that 51% um, in the middle, the people who are parking off street, we have a lot more people taking advantage of what is available to them, either for free or they're willing to pay a little bit to park off street. And then the transportation wallet is, is encouraging the behavior that we want. So we're seeing about 30% of the people who don't drive or park in either district. They're like, this is great. I'm getting a discounted uh, transit package. So I think that the transportation wallet can really be used as something that is, you know, ratcheting down the number of permits that we're <laughs> issuing and encouraging people to drive less. All right, let's look at a, for a moment at um, how the transportation wallet is introducing people to new mobility options. Um, I have selected just a couple of data points to talk about this. Um, there's probably a ton more that we can look at, but this is just like a little snapshot of um, how you get people who are used to driving alone to try new mobility options. So we asked people in our favorite survey that we keep referencing, um, how do you use the following modes before and after you got a transportation wallet? And so um, we, I, I pulled out the three um, components that are in the transportation wallet. So TriMet Streetcar Bike Town, you have um, those people reporting that they, they never used it in the past week. 
It's just something that they don't typically do. 29% um, of those respondents don't, don't drive. And so um, what the wallet is, like I was mentioning before, it's encouraging the behavior we want to see, which is people to drive less. So um, after they got the transportation wallet, this many people reported that they're using these modes more. And uh, you have over 40% of the people who had never used um, TriMet Streetcar and Bike Town say that they're using it. On the other side of that, almost nobody is driving more because of the wallet. So we're seeing an impact on uh, decreasing drive alone trips and increasing active modes. Um, I wanted to go into just this Bike Town uh, data point because I think it's pretty, uh, pretty huge. We've got over 80% of the people who um, have a transportation wallet, had never used Bike Town, never used the orange bikes, and now 40% more are using it. So I want to look at how much are they riding Bike Town. Um, for those of you watching remotely, our Bike Town bike share system is a smart bike system. So each bike is equipped with its own GPS. So we can see how much people are riding. We can track um, people by what type of membership plan they're a part of. So we were able to look at Bike Town ridership by transportation wallet purchasers. So I put a little caveat here. Um, I'm not able to see the people who opted out of their parking permit, how much they're riding Bike Town, but I am able to see for the people who actually bought it, um, how much they're riding Bike Town. And so when I uh, pulled this, these numbers, they're from September, so it's already increased from this point, but this is about 37% of total wallet holders. And so what this is a picture of is the orange is the Bike Town service area and the big blob is what's called a heat map. And so the yellow and red is the higher, con highest concentrations of bike town trips generated. And then it sort of blobs out into the blue. So it's basically showing where are people who have bought a transportation wallet, where are they riding and what's the frequency of their ridership. There's our two parking districts. And so you see that the highest concentration, obviously, is coming uh, from the parking districts. But then in between those parking districts, uh, we're seeing that, that purple color. That's our central business district. So we're, we're seeing that people are riding by town in between the two parking districts. 65% um, of the people who purchased a transportation wallet had never ridden by town, which is pretty huge. Um, especially considering that this is how many miles they have ridden. So, Back in January, darkest, coldest, wettest months of the year, uh, we had 96 riders doing 300 miles, which I think is pretty good, because how many of you are out there riding your bike in the rain, besides me? Um, by May, we had 523 riders uh, who had already ridden 6,600 miles, and then by September, we had 100 more riders who had already ridden 16,000 miles on Bike Town. So remember, this is only 37% of the total wallet holders. We don't expect every single person who has a transportation wallet to be riding bike town. That's just not realistic. Um, but we, if this is the trend that we're seeing, then we can expect that there's been a lot more people who have ridden um, bike town um, and contributed to these, these numbers. All right, let's talk about the future of the transportation wallet and kind of where we're going. So, what we're doing at PBOT, at Portland Bureau of Transportation, is we are using the transportation wallet as a mechanism for TDM across like so many of our programs. We've seen how um, beneficial this product uh, is and how it's a sustainable option. Um, so we're incorporating it now in a lot of new programs that are using a wallet-like model. So it won't be tied to the parking districts per se um, right away. Um, these are some of the near-term um, uses that we're going to have for it. So we're, so we're developing new programs that use this wallet as a model. We're adding new mobility options. So we're going to be adding car share for 2019. Um, you know, now that Portland has e-scooters, um, that could be an option in the future, but I put a big question mark. It's not like it's happening overnight, but it could be an option. Um, I also put a little picture there of the aerial tram. Um, that could be an option. The aerial tram is going to be getting a hop card reader soon. And so if it's all linked to the hop card, um, this could be a cool transportation package for people. So adding new mobility options. And then a big one is we are wanting to get a digital delivery mechanism. Right now it's analog. Um, so if we can kind of bring this into the 21st century, this would make a lot of sense, especially that a lot of these mobility options are shared mobility, and so they're already digitized anyway. Like Bike Town is all digital. It's car share, um, you use your phone to access the cars. Obviously, e-scooters, similar thing. Um, so how did we know that people wanted these things? 
well, we asked them, and we said, if you could build your own transportation wallet package for the same $99 base cost, uh, what would it include? And top answer, obviously, spend 99, get 150 on TriMet. Wow, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, people see a lot of utility in the annual streetcar pass, and obviously half of the respondents want the uh, Bike Town membership, so that's currently what's in the transportation wallet. Um, and then we see, you know, half of the people wanted e-scooter credit and car share credit, so that's great. Um, the aerial tram was an option, and 13% of the people who responded uh, said that that would be of utility to them. And uh, obviously, that's not an option that would work for everybody, but it is a subset. So if we can if we can make this transportation wallet package as um, uh, attractive as possible, that is better for us. Um, we're also considering hoverboards <laughs> and ellipticos. <laughs> okay, maybe not. All right. Um, Long-term vision of the transportation wallet. Uh, we are going to be expanding new parking districts in Portland. As Portland's growing, our commercial corridors are um, getting more congested and we're not seeing that turnover that we are seeing in our managed parking districts. And so if we're going to add more parking districts, we are then going to use the transportation wallet model as the TDM package to that. So um, that is something that is not happening overnight, but I think that's the direction we're going, especially as more people keep moving to Portland. We have a lot, a lot more um, uh, parking management strategies to, to figure out. Um, Wondering though if we can get a citywide transportation wallet package and not just have it solely exclusively linked to the parking districts. Um, if we can figure out a, a sustainable funding mechanism for that, I think that would be an equitable way of providing discounted transportation packages to people. And then we eventually want to include a low income version of the transportation wallet. TriMet has their low income fare uh, that they announced this year. And so we're figuring out a way that we can include that into what we do. So what do people have to say? Just pulled out a couple of quotes from the transportation and parking survey from earlier this year. Um, I just, I'm gonna read them because I think they're awesome. Um, I recently gave up my personal vehicle. The transportation wallet made it easy to try living without a car and easy, even easier to give up, thanks. Got rid of my car last year, bought transportation wallet last year, traded in Zone M Pass this year. Boom, I think it's awesome. Like the iterations, they're following us before we even had the transportation wallet. I appreciate the transportation wallet. I think it's a wonderful deal and it allows me to drive less so I do not have to worry about parking in my zone. And thanks for offering the transportation wallet as a free option. So people really see that utility of like, wow, this is cool. I get something by giving up my parking permit. So it's not all kittens and rainbows. We have our challenges. Um, I just want to emphasize that, you know, this may seem like it all comes across really easy and and straightforward, but we definitely have, have our challenges. I intentionally made this slide really boring. Um, I'll just read it out. So the, the, I think the biggest challenge that we have right now, just from a logistics side, is we have way too many steps involved to process these requests. We have all these different transportation providers. We're about to add car share. It's like we don't have one system that just makes it all seamless. So it's pretty, it's pretty hands-on. Um, and makes it kind of challenging. We also have a discrepancy between the ideal product we want to offer and the actual product that we can offer. Um, we don't have control over the, like how things are run, so we, we hear what people want, but we can't necessarily provide that uh, even though we want to. Not, not at this point. We're hoping that we can change that. And then, of course, the ideal user experience uh, is a little bit different than the actual user experience. So we recognize that there's some, there's some challenges. Um, there's also a limitation to what we can do with the transit card that we use, with the hop card, uh, with the functionality, and so we have to work within those parameters. Um, there's barriers right now to providing the low-income transit passes. So yes, we want to do that. Don't know if we can. Um, there's also lots of rules and restrictions and regulations that each transportation provider has, and so we have to go by their playbook, and so again, now that we're adding car share, coupled now with China, streetcar, bike town, it's like, how, wait, how do you run and what's your offer? So we, we have to just, uh, you know, be amenable to that. There's lots of different parameters here that we work with. Um, we're severely lacking our digital delivery of the product. Um, I'm hopeful for it. So while it's a challenge now, it's actually an opportunity. I'm hoping to um, figure something out in the next calendar year that by 2020, maybe we'll have something. 
And then the program is scaling up, but uh, Joey and I are the ones who <laughs> run and behind the scenes from the PBOT side, and it's just a lot. And there's a lot of customer service to all this. We're talking about these huge parking districts. So those are some of the challenges I wanted to highlight. All right, takeaways. If you have learned one thing today, I hope you have learned that by eliminating free parking, you are able to do something like the transportation wallet. You're able to address um, parking demand challenges. You're able to provide a, a sustainable funding source for something like the wallet. Um, I can't emphasize enough the importance of eliminating free parking. If you want to do something like this, uh, obviously we're doing it here in Portland, you're all here in Portland now, but for those of you who are watching remotely, um, how can you make this happen? You can make this happen by developing partnerships early on with all the different people that this kind of policy would touch. So businesses, residents, community members, obviously the transportation providers and the stakeholders, get people involved early on and like share this vision that everybody benefits from this. It's not that we're trying to tell people you can't drive. We're trying to say, Things are changing, and if you still want to be able to access uh, your places of employment and where you're going to go to shop um, and recreate, then we need to figure out a way that doesn't have everybody driving alone for every single trip all the time because you're just going to sit in gridlock. Start small and scale up. So I did not offer the transportation wallet as we know it now out the gate. I was offering these day passes and these week passes to kind of test the water, see if there was even a market for it. And I saw early on that there was. So really, you know, start small. Advertise clever and in myriad ways. So I had that whole list of all the different marketing strategies. Um, I can attest that every single one of them has resulted in people either knowing about the wallet, buying the wallet, opting out of their parking permits. If I only stuck to one methodology, I don't think we would have had the success that we've had. Um, and then make it, you know, make it, um, make it resonate with people. So yeah, I'm here talking about parking management, um, but I'm putting cute animals in my presentation. So, you know, resonate with people, make it fun. Use some of those behavioral science techniques, like look it up and get some ideas because there's like cool strategies and you're like, oh yeah, I never thought about that. While it might be one thing you're presenting in a different way, um, I think it, it can definitely resonate with people. And then finally, um, I can't emphasize enough how much we have had to adapt, adjust, re-envision and repeat this whole transportation wallet concept. And by staying flexible, um, I think we're able to um, adjust to all the changes that are happening. I mean, TriMet didn't even have the hot card until a year ago. Um, there's new, new um, uh, transportation providers coming online all the time. I mean, e-scooters have only been in Portland for a couple of months. Um, so it's really like, wow, what, what, do, we, what do we envision for this uh, transportation wallet package? Where could it go and, and what do we see are the trends to follow it? Are there um, digital service providers that can have some sort of app where we could offer this? So I think our success has really been based off of like staying really open to um, what this all can look like. All right, and I will leave it at that with a thank you and my information. And this is the time when you can ask questions about the Transportation Wallet. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Sarah. That was a really great presentation. I was wondering, um, in order, because I'm an economist, so I'm always thinking about how do we get, um, how do we get to how much do people are, how much are people actually willing to pay for their parking? Because I feel like that is usually an underpriced resource and that's why so many people are parking everywhere and i was wondering if uh, pbot would be open to doing some type of experimentation to figure out exactly what is uh, people's willingness to pay especially the people who already have permits how much would they take in order to give up their permit instead of um, offering like fixed packages um maybe trying to get at more accurately how much are they exactly willing to pay up to Thank you. Um, thank you, Jenny. That's a, that's a great question. So um, I think the first thing that comes to mind to answer that question is, um, can we figure out a pricing model which breaks down parking as, as, as if it was a utility? So you don't pay for all of your phone service all in one bundle. Um, but at the end of the year, you're like, wow, that was several hundred dollars. Um, so if we're willing to pay several hundred dollars to have cell phone service, what if we were able to do something similar with parking and we we made it so that you pay it in, in smaller increments? But it would also um, help out in the nicer months of the year where maybe you don't need to drive as much um, to take 
take other modes. Um, I think this would be helpful to change people's perception around, yep, you have this fixed price. It's like, no, maybe every month you consider whether you want it. Um, is PBOT open to that? I don't speak on behalf of the entire agency. Um, I, I do think that ideas like this are great to bring up to our stakeholder committees, and those are the ones who, who discuss on um, these types of policy implementations. So I think it's a great idea. Who's next? Yeah. Um, no, the, my main question would be, what is the, like, the greatest difference or the, the first difference you'd like to tackle between the ideal product you'd like to offer and the actual product you have right now? <laughs> Um, yeah, so the difference between the ideal product and the actual product. Um, I think ideally, looking at other places that do this, look, in, look to Europe, you have a lot of the transit authorities, they're all, they're all connected, and so you have one card and you just tap and can do everything. It's all, the fare integration is already there. Portland's not going to go there anytime soon. Um, it's not, it's, it's actually not how the U.S. functions. Um, so while that's a pie in the sky, I think having a little bit better connectivity with one sort of transit card that could unlock all of the different mobility options, that would be incredible. I don't think that's realistic um, in the next couple of years. Um, however, I do think that as we turn to more digital um, transportation options, like people open up their phone to find, you know, where an Uber or Lyft is, or they look where the bike town um, bike is. I think if we can have some digital interface that can combine all of these options and it can break out like a, like a wallet online that you can spend money on all those different platforms from one place, that to me would be the ideal user experience. So I think the, limiting the number of steps for people to figure out, wait, am I riding TriMet? Am I riding streetcar? Like, it's just like, you just don't have to think about it because you just tap your card or tap your phone or push a button. That is sort of the ideal. We don't want people to have to think all this transportation won't stuff. We just want them to drive less. Yeah. Have you ex experimented at all with uh, interoperability of the uh, actual physical hop card and the other systems that could be linked? I know right now we can link our Bike Town membership to that hop card. Um, is there ways to do that with some of the other things like Car2Go or Reach Now? Um, I'm not certain from like with the R. The, so our hop card is an RFID card. Um, I'm not sure if the car share companies can do that. I know that you can unlock the car with your phone, um, but looking at a way that the hop card can be more, more universal um, would be helpful to address actually what you were asking prior about how to make the user experience more seamless. Um, I don't know offhand uh, if, if that is possible, but I think that the technology is there. And so it's a matter of the different service providers saying, yeah, actually, we, we would like that. We agree to that. But are we there yet? No. But I think it's a worthwhile conversation to bring up because, again, one, one place of contact, one card, like that's where we really want to be going with all this. Yeah. Yeah. Have you been able to measure kind of the intangible measurement of the ripple effect? Because I know several people who have done, have the transportation wallet and they're all like, oh yeah, and I take TriMet and then I drag my partner along. And so th that, again, that ripple effect of how it impacts the people around them because they have access to this wallet. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, with the exception of, I, I will admit that Joey and I get a lot of really nice emails from people saying, we love the wallet, we love the customer service, we didn't expect A, B, and C. Like, we're really trying to make this be a good experience for people. Um, so with the exception of that, um, we also, on our transportation survey that we recently got, it's kind of a love fest. Um, it's nice to hear. Um, in terms of have we heard of its viralness um, affecting other people, only anecdotally, um, and so it's good good to hear that. We have run, one of our marketing strategies was to refer a friend because in 2017, we were only offering $50 on the hop card. And then by the calendar year of 2018, we were offering $100 all of a sudden. We're like, ah, what are all those people? Like, 
they're missing out. So we were like, refer a friend and we'll just give you 50 extra dollars. And so we did. So we're trying to come up with ideas around how, yeah, how do we bring people along? And it's nice to hear that people are encouraging people who they know to say, hey, come along and take this. This is great. So thank you for that. Um, my question deals with transportation equality, and in particular, I'm thinking of people with disabilities who might not have the ability to ride bike town or something like that, but yet they still have to live and work in these districts, and they're automatically subjected to the surcharge. I mean, how, is there any provision, provisions for them for dealing with that, or are they just kind of like out of luck? Can you clarify what you mean by like they're automatically subject to a certain um, subject? If they if they have to drive um, for work because of whatever reason disability, and so they have to have a parking permit. Gotcha. Um, so we do offer a so yeah so nobody is exempt from uh, a parking permit in the parking district. We do have a uh, exemption for residents who qualify as low income in the Northwest Parking District. Um, but in terms of you know how do we have a strategy that that is equitable for all people? Um, it's it is a one size fits all that if you need a parking permit, you pay for it with the exception of people who live on low incomes in Northwest Portland. Um, we do, I mean, I, I get what you're saying that they're subject to it, but it's, it's if, if we're gonna manage the whole parking district, then everybody needs to pay their fair share because the minute we unvalue, devalue what the city is already subsidizing in mostly free parking around the city, then we're devaluing the whole purpose of a managed parking district. Um, one thing I didn't mention, and it kind of touches on what you're getting at, but it's a little bit different, is we do offer an honored citizen version of the wallet for people who qualify 65 or older or on Medicare, Medicaid. Um, and so when they ride bus and streetcar, the value of the TriMet um, hop value is, is double that of somebody who got the regular fare. Um, but I think that's a good question um, that you know maybe could could be brought up if, if that is a user group who, uh, for uh, whatever circumstances, um, doesn't have that option, um, that maybe we change that policy. And that's what's great about working with the parking district stakeholder committees is we're able to come up with ideas on, yeah, maybe this is something we should incorporate in the future. So, any final questions? All right, well, thank you everybody for coming and listening about the Transportation Wallet Program.